needing a break before they can get one, or they're not going to get it. Well then, hi. Um, yeah, as Rodney pointed out, you can't see a single thing from up here. It's really, uh, really something. Um, sort of like uh, standing on the end of a runway with a 747 coming at you. Not that I've done that, but I hear it's kind of like that. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk here about uh, security engineering and what we've done for uh, Windows Vista. A uh, couple of things I want to mention about this. Uh, first off, I like playing with PowerPoint, so you'll see some of that. Um, what, yeah, w once upon a time, I, uh, I used to uh, build demos for Office, the technical side of it. But you have to learn how to use all the fancy features, so that's kind of me. Anyway, uh, I'll talk about who I am, what it is that I'm really here to discuss, um, and then I'll delve into what we did in terms of our view of how to build uh, Vista as securely as possible. Um, show you sort of an example uh, case study that occurred about a year ago, and uh, then if we actually have any time left, and now that we're running a bit late, who knows? Uh, but I'll take questions as best I can. So start off, just uh, give you uh, a quick heads up. If you saw the, uh, the the Vista security presentation at Black Hat or Hack in the Box, uh, you've already seen the important stuff that's here. There's not really a whole lot of new content. I've rejiggered it a bit to make it a bit easier to uh, follow everything that's going on. But other than that, it's it's not really new information. What we did a year ago for Vista is basically what we did for Vista. And I'm not really to a point yet where I can talk much about what we're doing for future versions of Windows. It's cool stuff. I just can't talk about it yet. So a uh, quick thing about who I am. Um, I'm lead security program manager in the Windows Security Assurance Group. Uh, what we do in Windows Security Assurance um, we evangelize security to the organization throughout Windows. So people who are developers, testers, program managers, the like, get them to understand why security is important and what it is that they really ought to be doing. Uh, our team also does some consultation on design and implementation. Uh, we are uh, training various people in the organization on uh, the attacker techniques and how to defend against them. And we also are responsible for developing and enforcing the security policies. Uh, so I joined Microsoft 14 years ago. It's really hard to believe that it's been that long. But uh, I've done stuff, uh, deployment and management support, worked in the financial services group when we had a much larger financial services group than we do today, uh, done some online security since then, and most recently moved into Windows security. You can sort of see how the uh, migration occurred to get me where I am. So I just want to make it clear, I'm going to talk about what we did in Vista, uh, the security engineering activities, some of our security initiatives. Um, also want to get feedback on, on things that we ought to be doing better. Uh, I want to make it very clear, though, that I'm not here to talk about security features. So stuff like BitLocker, TPM integration, uh, even the details of, of uh, some of the, the fancier security features, uh, just not part of what this is about. Um, so it's more about our design philosophies and how we, uh, we did the engineering. So in talking about this, um, we basically started with what we had done for the security development lifecycle for XPSP2. And then we had a series of goals. Uh, we wanted to apply least privilege throughout the architecture. Uh, this is stuff that actually uh, Rodney was talking about, where you've got um, anything that you don't need to be running, but you have running, is a potential place for something to uh, be used by an attacker, because code's not perfect. You see where this all leads. If you don't need it, why should it be there? That's kind of what we were looking at. Um, we wanted to automate as much as possible. We also uh, wanted to take 
security expertise throughout the industry and apply it as methodically as we could on the operating system as a whole, and then do some other defense in depth kind of things. Those are fun, but uh, we'll talk about those last. So the idea really is we wanted to uh, stop playing whack-a-mole, where we keep coming out with these big piles of uh, patches once a month. Uh, and by the way, before I go any further, I should point out, whack-a-mole actually has no K. I looked this up on the internet, and since it's on the internet, it must be true. Therefore, uh, there is no K on this slide. It's apparently a trademark without a K. Uh, so, uh, the office spell checker did not know that. But look, I figure if it's on Wikipedia, it's got to be right. So, uh, let's start by talking about the, the least privileged stuff. Um, the idea here is uh, if you've got programs that are running in situations like, oh, I don't know, you're running a system, you're running as admin, uh, a compromise in that bit of code means you own the box. That's kind of bad. So uh, what we want to do is try and make sure that if you don't have to be system, if you don't have to be administrator, don't do it. Means that if that particular piece of code gets compromised, you're not going to be quite as bad off as you otherwise might be. So uh, first couple of things we did with that was to try and make it so that people could actually use standard user as their regular, everyday kind of environment. Uh, this has been something that's been a complaint for a long time. We talked about this way back in NT3.1. There was this concept of standard user, and it was great. You couldn't do anything. So uh, we're trying to make it so that it's something more useful for a standard user to live in. And even administrators, uh, if you really need to do the heavy-duty administrator stuff, that's something that should only happen when you need it. Uh, so those two were really the impetus behind uh, user account control. That's what it's about. It's not really so much a security feature in and of itself as it is a means of allowing you to run with fewer privileges than you otherwise might. Uh, also, we did some stuff with uh, Internet Explorer to be able to run in a more restricted environment so that uh, it basically virtualizes a lot of the operating system. Uh, so an attacker that attacks that really attacks a little sandbox. Then uh, we went to harden some services. Again, just like it is with running the applications with least privilege, you want to run the services with only the privileges that are necessary. So in order to do that, we needed to define what those restrictions were. That way you can be able to come back and test, do, does it actually work the way you were expecting it to, and uh, what was the, the, the small space that you needed. So um, let me drill a bit more into this idea of, of hardening the services. We spent time on this because services are uh, fun for attackers. Sasser, Blaster, Slammer. There's a lot of errs on the end of these. Do you notice? What is it about worms and err? They're uh, uh, Tom can be built out of it. Ah. Yeah, that, that must make sense. Err? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, they're... Uh, <laughs> that's good. Uh, they, they're great because, uh, services are great because the machine's on, it's plugged into the network like so many people do at home and at work and whatever, and maybe they're working on the machine, maybe they're not, but the thing's on 24-7. Services are on 24-7. Services are fun. Usually, in, uh, they tend to run in these elevated identities. Most of these services have historically run as system. Yum. Uh, and of course, you know, worms like that, they can do things like altering the OS, they can open whatever connections they want to be able to spread themselves throughout the network. And uh, so obviously, if you can stop all of that, that's a pretty good defense against uh, a lot of the attacks that have been used in the past. So we wanted to get services to stop being system. So we have local service. We have network service. Um, they're not members of administrators, so they can't do the kinds of things that admins can do. Um, they're denied the most powerful privileges, SCDebug, SCTCB, that sort of stuff. So they're much more restricted than uh, anything that historically would have been running as system. So a uh, bunch of these uh, services in XPSP2 that were running a system, uh, some of them were moved to local service, Windows Audio, DHCP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had a different set that were moved to network service. Those are the ones that, well, you would expect to be connecting to the network. Not a surprise. Of course, uh, Vista has a bunch of new services. So, 
48% uh, of those are also going to be running in a low privilege account in Vista. Um, if they were having to run as system, they actually did have to justify why they needed to have those sorts of elevated privileges. That was part of our enforcement uh, uh, effort on our team. So uh, some of what we started to do is have uh, specific service SIDs. And uh, so that way you can, uh, you can ACL down the various objects so that they apply to a particular service. They're owned by that service and only accessible to that service. Uh, nice thing is it's integrated into the uh, existing APIs, the lookup account SID, lookup account name. So uh, it, it didn't require substantial new work to be able to implement it. Uh, this is sort of an example of one of them. Uh, turns out to be a uh, crypt service. Uh, the the uh, fun thing about it, you notice how long the SIDs have gotten? Compare that to what they look like in NT3.1, just for what it's worth. They, they, eventually, they're going to get too long to fit on a slide. It's getting there. Um, we also wanted to just eliminate all the unnecessary privileges altogether, as I mentioned before. So um, we said, if you're going to have a service, you have to enumerate what the privileges are that you need. And so this is an opt-in kind of an approach. If you don't say you need it, you don't get it. If you don't get it, you don't have access to it. So um, now what happens then is if you happen to have a, uh, a single service that's got multiple processes in it, it takes, um, or sorry, the other way around. Single process that has multiple services in it, uh, you get a case where it, uh, it takes the union of all of the, the privileges and that is um, what the process gets as its, uh, as its privilege set. Uh, so needless to say, we wanted to have um, as few processes as possible. Lots of processes makes a lot of complicated stuff in IPC, more stuff to manage. Um, and also, uh, at the same time, we didn't want it so that you had a single process that had all the services in it, and so all of a sudden it looks like local system, even though it wasn't supposed to be. So basically, we had a balancing act there that we were working on. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like when you're uh, enumerating uh, what it is that you need. We looked through those, and we found uh, a few consistent themes. And so because we found these themes, we were able to group a bunch of similar sorts of services into uh, single processes. Um, I'll mention that actually in the next slide. Um, but uh, the gist here also is if you're going to be having uh, network access, you say what ports you need, what directions you need. Uh, the, the nice thing about that is if you have a vulnerability and you happen to be uh, a service that uses port 123, that's not going to be accessible uh, through port 80. So it's not going to be able to be reused to do HTTP connections elsewhere. The uh, firewall actually does the enforcement of this. So this is the grouping that I was talking about. Um, so you can see there's uh, uh, six of the primary ones. This basically covers uh, the vast majority of the services that exist in the OS. So um, you're not actually going to see a whole lot of service hosts running. You will see more than you had in XPSP2, but it's not by you know 50 or 100 or anything of that sort. Uh, so we were able to, to group them together and reduce the total number of service hosts that had to be running. Uh, not a whole lot else to say there other than you can see where this leads. Uh, so take a look, for example, at, at what happened with DHCP client. Um, in XPSP2, that was running a system, uh, had 24 privileges. It, was, uh, uh, it had a network identity as, as a machine account, uh, which is kind of cool, because then you can uh, identify yourself as this machine and do all sorts of things that you otherwise shouldn't be able to do with something like DHCP client. Um, could use any port you wanted. And uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't locked down with a service SID. So we changed all of that stuff in Vista. It's now running as local service, only has four privileges, no identity whatsoever on the network, um, only uses the DHCP port, and uh, it is locked down with a service SID, much more uh, restricted than what we had before, and therefore much less that you can do in the way of damage. So um, automation. Automation's great. Love automation. Uh, because, let's face it, you don't want to go around uh, having humans doing machines' jobs. Um, I'll show you kind of some of the stuff that we did here in terms of code analysis. You got a case here, uh, code with uh, buffer x equals 5. So if you're given that, um, how big is buff? 
What's the value of x? It's a trick question. It's a trick question. That's the point. You, you can't tell based on what you're given uh, what the, the size of buff is, what the value of x is. Um, there's not a formal association in uh, C and C++. Very powerful, very dangerous. You sort of go around with uh, walking the tightrope without a net underneath. So uh, Sal was produced to help address this. It's kind of like what ITL does for RPC. It gives you definitions that you can establish there um, to basically set up contracts so that uh, code that calls you is, is able to determine what sizes the buffers are supposed to be, that, that sort of thing. It was basically so that we could do um, a static type analysis on code uh, to find buffer overruns. So uh, here's simple sample code to, to show you how it works. Um, fairly straightforward stuff, setting up the buffers. We got ourselves a pointer. We got the function that writes uh, that many characters to buff. Thing is, of course, if CCH buff is greater than the size of buff, you're going to walk off the end of buff, and you've got yourself a buffer overrun. This is about as simple as it gets, right? So uh, you go in and put in some SAL annotation in front of it. Now what you're saying is, uh, this is going to be uh, written to this particular uh, buffer here, um, and it's not going to be null. Um, it's a size of uh, an element. That's the, the, your data type there. Um, and how many elements in size is it going to be? So once you've established that, then when you've got code that does something really ugly like this, where you allocate 200 and you try and stuff 210 characters into it, needless to say, you've got yourself a nice little buffer overrun there. Bad stuff can happen. Who knows what? Uh, we all know what. Anyway, if you try and compile this now, because of cell annotation, you're going to get a warning here that you've got a potential buffer overrun. It's supposed to be 200 times 2 bytes, but you might shove 420 in there. Uh, it's also possible that you would uh, not fill it at all. You might have null. Two bad things that are bad together. So um, that's how it works here. Now, in the real world, um, I don't know how many of you remember this. It's now been over a year. But uh, there was this lovely advisory about the BG sound where you put in a really, really long file name. And uh, the workaround was pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, we weren't really happy uh, when that was the official workaround for this, um, needless to say. Uh, so here's the code that had the problem. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there's your uh, buffer overrun. It's really obvious, right? Uh, yeah. Well, OK, so let's, let's take a look at really how this all comes together when you put it with uh, uh, prefast and sal. So uh, we've got our uh, two snippets of code here. Um, and uh, actually, we got, uh, you'll notice on November 24th, uh, we had a bug opened by prefast. Yes, that was before the advisory went out. I just want to mention that. It was, however, after the code went out. Prefast. What's prefast? Prefast is the, is the code analysis tool. Sorry. The, it, the, yeah, have I never meant that? Yeah, OK. Prefast is code analysis tool. Uh, it basically goes through and looks for bugs of this sort. Uh, we have a series of rules in there that come from uh, various vulnerabilities that were found in the past. And uh, those rules are designed to look at uh, situations that are similar to the vulnerabilities that have been found in the past and find them elsewhere in the code. So we have little spiders running through the code looking for similar situations, and they go give us these alerts. Um, so November 24th of 2005, 5.50 in the morning. Isn't that like Thanksgiving? God, they were working on Thanksgiving. Anyway, um, so here we had this uh, potential overflow using the PWZ temp path. Uh, because we had this uh, buffer access unbounded by the buffer size, um, there was no constant con uh, that was constraining the size of CCH path. So uh, that was where our buffer overrun happened. Um, you'll notice there uh, it says that it had found that the buffer was supposed to be uh, 260 elements. That's what we had allocated, but we had no idea actually what was getting stuffed into there. So someone shoves 261 in there. Ta-da, you got a buffer overrun. Uh, so here it's a case where you've got uh, annotation 
that requires that the second parameter be of uh, length greater than or equal to uh, the parameter three elements at two bytes per element. Um, and parameter two is uh, the one that's calling the, uh, the PWZ temp path for its data typing. So um, that's sort of how you find the path to connect all this together. And that's really the work that Prefast does. It opens these bugs. Now we have an opportunity then to track them, uh, find out what the problem was, fix it, and uh, get it addressed before it ever hits the streets. You'll notice this particular case, it hit the street in uh, uh, Vista Beta 2, I guess it was. Um, but turns out that uh, we did actually find it before it was found on the streets. Um, anyway, the, the whole point behind this is as we get these various uh, vulnerabilities reported to us, either internally or externally, we're able to do root cause analysis on it, figure out what did we do wrong, what did we miss. If it's a situation that's generalizable, we can turn it into a set of rules that Prefast looks for in the future. If it finds stuff like that, it automatically logs bugs, the bugs get fixed, and we don't have the vulnerabilities in the wild anymore. It's kind of cool. Um, so in this particular case, uh, after the Zotob worm uh, occurred, um, Prefast had an additional warning added. That was 2015, which was the one that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so we set that one uh, to autofile the bugs. Bug automatically got filed there on Thanksgiving or whenever that was. Um, turns out there were a few other ways that it was caught as well. Uh, so the first, it was immediately caught by Prefast um, on that November build. Um, that was the cell annotation. It was also found uh, about a week later when we were doing some internal fuzzing. Yet another process that we go through. Um, it was also reported through Windows error reporting. And uh, so basically, three different ways that this one was caught, there's no question in our minds uh, that it would have been caught and fixed prior to uh, RTM, even if that uh, advisory had not gone out. Um, so the idea here is, we're trying to build this iterative loop where we collect additional information, figure out what kinds of things we've been missing, and turn them into processes that we can automate so that we uh, catch those much more quickly and uh, easily in the future. It's a lot less expensive than uh, hiring hundreds of thousands of people. Not to mention it's hard to find people who do this stuff. Um, the other thing is uh, then we've had file parsers have been uh, under attack. Um, You'll notice we had a, a few over those uh, about a year and change uh, of these file parsers that were attacked. And uh, most recently, actually, I haven't even put on here, we had the ANI uh, attack against uh, uh, Vista, in fact. Um, and uh, so I'll actually allude to that in the next slide here. But uh, what we've been doing is taking a, a multi-prong approach on the parsers. Um, one thing is to just automate them. A lot of the attackers, the way that they're finding these vulnerabilities is they're running fuzzers. Well, hey, look, we can run fuzzers too. And the cool thing is we get to run the fuzzers on the code before the attackers. Uh, the not so cool thing is attackers have an infinite amount of time. We don't. So we, we uh, do have that as our, our disadvantage. Um, anyway, we have uh, a, a, actually a few now uh, internally developed fuzzers. We've also uh, made use of some externally developed fuzzers. Um, the, uh, the highest risk parsers get uh, DDL extensions. Um, and then for uh, the real tough targets, uh, we actually go through and take time to, uh, to customize some smart fuzzers so that uh, those get the, uh, the greatest depth of, uh, uh, of analysis. Um, so we uh, have gotten to the point now uh, through our code coverage analysis that we can actually reduce the, uh, the size of our templates so that we don't have to do a whole bunch of tests that would basically be redundantly exercising the same segment of code. Um, we're getting better at this, uh, but this is, this is sort of the, the bleeding edge of our uh, fuzzing effort. Uh, but for example, we, we had 19,000 JPEGs. We were able to reduce that to 47 and get the same amount of uh, effective code exercising. Um, that's exercising not in like the exorcist kind of sense. Uh, the other thing is on some other areas uh, where it's really necessary, we go and get security experts who are uh, particularly well versed in certain areas of, of the code of the OS. Uh, so we'll go through and do, uh, do much more detailed analysis 
with those. Now that, of course, is much more expensive, much slower, but you get better coverage. So you use that where it really is going to get you the biggest bang for the buck. Um, oh, so yeah, let's talk a bit more about the security expertise, shall we? Uh, that's our next area. Um, I don't know if you recognize that particular picture. That was Soylent Green, yes. Ah, great, great movie. Um, it's interesting. They talked about uh, uh, global warming as causing starvation on the planet. This was in 1970, I believe. Sort of an interesting thing to consider. Anyway, um, security expertise. So lots and lots of features in Vista that needed the uh, analysis done on them. Uh, so we divided them into different, different categories. Um, for some of them, we decided that they would be best served by doing uh, externally commissioned pen tests. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about some of the people who've done those kinds of, of uh, tests. But basically, they would go through and specifically try and take this stuff apart piece by piece. Uh, for the other stuff, we'd take a look at what looked like high-risk features. Um, for those high-risk features, we'd go through and do a design review to see how it was that they were planning on implementing it in the first place. Then we'd come back later, do an implementation review to see what they said at the beginning. Did, is that really what they produced? And often is not. There were some differences, and some actually made uh, uh, stuff that looked really good in the design review be not so great in the implementation review. Um, and then we also had uh, some horizontal investigations. These were areas where they weren't feature specific. They were uh, design constructs that apply across lots of features, things like RPC, network listeners, that sort of stuff. Um, so all those together uh, put different kinds of prongs into uh, changes in, in the, the uh, code of Vista, all designed to give us security improvements. Fairly straightforward when you think about it, but it really was very methodical. So um, pen testing was the uh, largest pen test in the company's history. Now, granted, we haven't exactly been doing pen tests for 50 years or anything, but this was by far uh, much greater than we've done on anything else in the past. Uh, we had an internal team of hackers. Uh, these were people who are closely related to um, MSRC, the uh, Microsoft Security Response Center. So the folks who answer secure at Microsoft.com, there's a, a group that uh, sits pretty much right next to them uh, who's responsible for taking those exploits and trying to figure out how do those exploits work? Are there places elsewhere in the operating system where those would be applicable? These hackers were brought in uh, to work on some of the uh, uh, features of Vista. Uh, so we had a bunch of different penetration tests going on simultaneously, a bunch of different features, just by the internal team of hackers. We also had uh, what we called the Blue Hat hackers. Um, you may have heard of Blue Hat. It's uh, basically a security conference that's sort of like Black Hat, but it's at Microsoft, specifically for Microsoft developers and employees and such. So uh, we've hired some of those people as uh, consultants. Um, for Vista, we had uh, over 20 of them that we crammed in a uh, decent-sized room, but it was you know, not the size of this room or anything. Um, neat thing that, was, that happened was there was an awful lot of synergy that went on. You know, This is sort of like extreme development. You get a bunch of different people who have areas of focus, and they shout across the room at each other. You know, um, you've got somebody who's, who's uh, doing some uh, some stuff with uh, HTTP, and you can talk to the guy who's uh, focused on TCP. Be able to uh, very quickly get some answers of how you might be able to put some things together um, that would create an attack that isn't necessarily obvious at first blush. These folks had access to the full source code, all the symbols, the specs, the threat models. Um, they basically were able to get access to everything that any developer at Microsoft has um, and what's really interesting about it is because they weren't feature specific, uh, they were sort of agnostic. You know, a lot of people, when you're, when you're working on a particular feature, your focus is on that feature and that feature alone, uh, you get kind of parochial about it. These folks, hey, they, whatever, they can go and talk to anybody about anything at any time, and they often did. It was very interesting to see the kinds of things that they uncovered. Uh, everything that they needed in the way of people was uh, within a building away from them. Uh, so for each target, they'd spend anywhere from a week to a couple of months, and they could ask anybody anything about anything, and they got answers. So some of the things that uh, showed up. Um, rabbit holes. 
This is where, you know, because this was a sort of extreme development environment, you've got all these 20 plus people in a room. They put their various uh, discoveries together and they'd be able to determine that, well, by going through this code to this code to that code to that code to that, you can gain access to system. Aha, that's pretty cool. Uh, so what at first blush looks like it's not a big deal because, well, this thing runs as, you know, some heavily restricted snippet of code. Uh, if they could find a path that would ultimately get them to owning the box, it became a big deal. They found quite a few of them, actually. Um, this was great. The uh, uh, security assumptions that you'd find in threat models. You know, feature one says, hey, well, we don't have to do anything. We don't parse anything. We just pass it down to uh, those other guys. The other guys say, hey, we don't have to do any validation. They did the validation for us. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it does happen. It happened more than I'd like to see. So um, we did find some of these and we got them addressed. Failures of imagination. People who develop features develop them expecting them to be used a particular way. A uh, typical developer of, say, uh, a slotted screwdriver doesn't expect it to be used as a chisel. But somebody gets that slotted screwdriver in their hand, and by God, they will use it as a chisel. A similar sort of thing that happens with code. You're not really expecting it to be used in some of the ways that it ends up being used. Uh, you know, developers like to be really clever. And sometimes being really clever means that uh, you're more clever than the person who wrote the code that you're using, or at least you think you're more clever. And as a result, you uh, end up exposing some stuff that never was designed to be exposed, but ends up being exposed. These were also discovered. Many of them were uh, the kinds of things that led to those rabbit holes. Uh, we found even some just weird random stuff, some file names that uh, weren't exactly the best choices, like this one. So this one showed up. And uh, all of a sudden, a bunch of reports started coming in. Oh my god, I just installed the operating system and I just got owned! <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. It was, this was the winlog on session zero viewer window hook DLL. Besides, most attackers these days aren't really that interested in advertising that they've uh, just owned your box unless they're just out looking for, uh, you know, cleverness brownie points. Anyway, uh, this is one of my favorites. This, this was actually in the code for Vista. Uh, really, the, the description that was uh, given was almost like a haiku. <laughs> or I called it a high code. Anyway, uh, interesting stuff. Hard to read, hard to understand, but pretty cool when you finally figure out what it does. OK, so uh, on to the defense in depth stuff. Yeah. Recognize that one? Never. War games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we uh, were thinking from the point of view of having to look several moves ahead. Um, did some stuff to GS, for example. Um, did better stack protection. So uh, it's better in terms of looking further ahead in the code um, through the annotations that we've got. And uh, so we're able to find situations like this where your uh, return address way down there, you might be able to actually walk all the way down there. And uh, now this is something that can be caught a bit more easily. Um, did some stuff to the heap. Not doing the leukocytes. Um, got uh, the, uh, the block header integrity check, so we're able to do uh, better error detection. Um, and uh, oh, I really dug this one, the, the pseudo random base address. So um, it's not always in the same place makes it a little uh, harder for attackers to take advantage of what historically has been, ah, yes, you know it's going to be there when you're done. Um, we also have the, uh, the feature of uh, heap terminate on corruption. So uh, basically, it's canaries. If the canary dies, uh, you yank the uh, application that was running at the process. Um, that's on by default on the 64-bit version. It's on for services of most apps on x86. We couldn't have it on by default on x86 because too many things that needed to work stopped working. What does that tell you about those applications? Badly written. Badly written. Yeah, the problem is, of course, we could you know, have had it on by default for x86, and those badly written applications wouldn't work, and then people would be calling complaining because their code doesn't work. Uh, the stuff that they paid good money for back in uh, 1997 that they still want to run 
on the new version of the operating system. It's what I call the uh, what if you threw a war and nobody came. It would be great to build this wonderfully secure operating system that nobody can buy because they can't use what they still need. It's a real exercise in frustration, I have to say. That's the sort of stuff that, that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. Uh, there was more talked about uh, uh, Adrian's talk back in at Black Hat uh, last summer. Um, did uh, function pointer encoding as well. Um, nothing terribly fancy here, but it's sort of what you would expect. If you encode the function pointer, then it makes it a little harder for an attacker to predict uh, where the pointers are going. Um, so it just does uh, either the XOR with the per process cookie or the XOR with the shared cookie in the shared user's data, depending on whether it's a system pointer or not. Uh, also, data execution protection. Um, it, on older PCs, uh, NX was not something that uh, was available uh, in the hardware. So it was kind of a, an interesting thing to have as, as the software version of depth for XPSP2, but not especially powerful. Uh, these days, since you need a pretty new machine to run Vista anyway, those are all the ones that uh, also have NX support on them. Um, I will say, though, uh, most machines that I've seen thus far that can run Vista have NX turned off by default in the hardware. So you've got to go in and you've got to manually turn it on up in the BIOS settings and blah, blah, blah. But if you do, you can enable it as part of the OS as well. Um, the default is to have it opted in. Um, so Xs that are linked using the NX Compact, yes, those have NX turned on uh, permanently. Um, all the services in Windows were able to do it. Most of the Xs also were able to do it. Um, yeah. You can switch into the opt-out mode. Uh, there's a dialog box in Vista, um, and in fact, I do this, uh, where I have everything turning NX on, and then you opt out just for the things that, um, uh, that are not compatible with NX. Uh, what was the one that I found? I found one um, spyware blaster, oddly enough, which I love that program. But you have to turn NX off for it. What does that tell you? Anyway, moving right along. So uh, stuff that's been said about that. Uh, basically said, hey, this is pretty cool, but you know you can work around it. Um, one thing that would be really cool, though, if you wanted to defend against working around it, would be to do some form of address space layout randomization. Good idea. So we did it. Works with uh, data execution protection. The idea between uh, uh, the idea behind ASLR is that you don't know where the executable code uh, is going to run. We're in memory. So uh, it makes it a lot harder for you to uh, write exploit code that's going to be able to point to particular routines because you don't know exactly where they are. Um, now, they have to opt in. So this means that it's not available for uh, every application that you would have, um, but it is available for um, uh, most of Windows. Um, Actually, all of Windows, but separate story. So part of what we had to figure out is how to, how to do this balance in terms of uh, the, the uh, granularity. And so uh, you, know, you want to have as many as possible uh, variations in where the code would, would end up running. But at the same time, you need to have these blocks be large enough that the executables can have sufficient uh, contiguous space so that they're not going to slow to a crawl. So uh, it. We basically got to where it's uh, 100 and, I don't know, 114 or something uh, possible places where uh, your code might start. Um, that gives you uh, basically a 99.5% chance that an attack uh, will fail the first time. Now, needless to say, if you have an attack that's going to be against code that automatically restarts, OK, so you hit it, and you know, after 60 tries or so, you're, uh, you're about going to hit a, uh, a success. Um, so some of the kinds of defenses that we had were putting in code that would recognize when it was restarting a bunch of times and go, oh, wait a minute, somebody's trying to attack me. But again, that requires that you be aware of it. So development of new code needs to opt into ASLR and needs to be aware of when it is automatically restarting, if it happens to even have the capability of automatically restarting. Typically, services are more uh, in that vein than applications. Um, turned out that uh, by achieving this balance, we really didn't end up having a net change in performance of the OS. Some things were a bit faster, some slower. 
Um, and we've been, uh, we've been doing pretty well in terms of app compat. So I've, I'm pleased with the ultimate results. Uh, all the features of, of Vista did opt into this. So the entire OS is running with ASLR. So I want to wrap up here with a, a case study. Um, the one that has been mentioned a couple of times here, Zotab. Uh, so Zotab was pretty bad for anyone who was running Windows 2000. It was a remote, unauthenticated code execution. Own the box just by it sitting there being plugged into the network, kind of ugly. Um, there wasn't an SDL, of course, back when we were doing Windows 2000, so I guess that shouldn't come as a great shock. Uh, Vista SP, or I'm sorry, XP SP1, same sort of thing, but uh, it did happen to have uh, a restricted ACL. So there was a, a little bit of sort of almost accidental security there. Um, Server 2003 uh, happened to have an RPC callback um, instituted with the intent of being uh, more secure, um, and this just happened to make it so that uh, it was not a, a remote vulnerability any longer. Uh, XPSB2, well, <laughs> it was based on Server 2003, so uh, it shouldn't be a huge shock that it picked that up as well. Uh, but even if it turned out that we had missed it in XPSB2, that it hadn't picked up that uh, Server 2003 RPC callback, would have turned out that... Uh, because we had the firewall on by default in XPSP2, that Zotab would not have uh, been wormable in XPSP2. Well, in Vista, let's look at it. Uh, we had the prefast and prefix code scanners, so the buffer overrun would most likely have been caught there. But, you know, if we happened to miss it because we didn't create a rule yet that was going to find it, well, we also were doing the RPC fuzzing and penetration testing. And even if we missed it there, we had the improved version of GS, the improved version of safe SEH, should have caught it at compile time. Uh, even if that didn't do it, you're also protected by NX being turned on and ASLR being en enabled. And even if all of those, well, we still had that firewall on by default. So it still would have been blocked. So you can see, I mean, the, the point isn't I, I, I want to make it really clear. The point is not there are no vulnerabilities in Vista. I'm not going to be um, like some vendors and stand up here and say, it's unbreakable. I recognize uh, that it's a big, complicated operating system. We covered a tremendous amount of territory in Vista. We have numerous instances of things like this where we caught a tremendous number of, of bugs that were in the operating system that could have been exploitable but aren't because we have these various tools available to us. So just to give you sort of a visual comparison, uh, with XPSP2, you can think of those big Windows logos, like the surface area of the OS. Um, we covered a number of things, even in, in the XPSP2 days, we trained people on how to be secure, we did threat models and looked at them, uh, we were tracking the security bugs that we found and made sure that they were getting fixed, we had prefix, um, we were working on making sure that the, the uh, default permissions of uh, applications and services were restricted. Uh, feature teams did code reviews. They also had other features who would review each other's uh, code. It was good stuff. As we moved into Vista, um, first thing was we replaced a lot of those manual code reviews with the automated tools. We get much more coverage, much more quickly, much more effectively. So. Uh, those tools, a lot of those are like uh, these guys over here uh, doing the prefast. Uh, we scan code for APIs that are uh, really bad, often, uh, uh, really often leading to buffer overruns, stuff like stir copy. You know. uh, SAL annotation, which we described earlier, was put into all the new code in the OS. Um, oh, this was an interesting one. The, the third-party code SDL tracking. Uh, that's one of the people I worked very closely with who was uh, working on this, looking to make sure that even code that didn't belong to Windows, that didn't even belong to Microsoft, followed the SDL as much as was reasonable. We obviously have some things that are internal only. But uh, we were making sure that, that code that came from other companies also had to follow the SDL um, or else had to have a serious justification for why they couldn't. Was that FXCOP? Uh, okay. Jack, FXCOP. I'm trying to remember what it does. It's Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's another code analysis tool, but I'm trying to remember. It's a static analysis tool. Um, 
and I'm trying to remember what it was. It's supposed to look for the, the different settings that you had, uh, like that you had, uh, had to have GS enabled, that you had to have safe SEH enabled. Um, what's that? I'm oh, sorry. It's the government's backdoor into the system. Government's backdoor into the system. You know, but based on the name, that would be great. Very clever. But no, uh, it, it's basically, it's supposed to do an analysis to make sure that you have the appropriate settings so that we didn't have to manually go back and look at it. And it generates basically an Excel spreadsheet and tells us, did all of your components pass and which ones failed? And because it's in Excel, you can very easily do the, uh, uh, the collapsing down the rows so that you'd see only the things that said failed. And then you'd be able to very quickly find them and beat them up. Really kind of cool, but anyway. Um, other stuff that we did, sort of these depth kinds of, of things, design reviews, uh, many security pushes for some of the features that needed some, some extra time doing a, a, a uh, sort of stop coding, stop testing, stop doing anything other than looking at, your, at the security. The penetration testing I mentioned, uh, some special projects that I can't talk about, but we had some other things that we did as well. Um, and finally, uh, the file parts are fuzzing, the service hardening that gave us some additional targeted views. Now, as I said, there's some gaps in there. There's spaces in there. There's stuff that we didn't cover. There's stuff that we missed. This is why we have things like the, the uh, ANI vulnerability that came out. Uh, we fuzzed ANI a lot. We still missed it. We had all those other kinds of things that I talked about on the previous slide. We still missed it. There's not going to be... Uh, an, an absolute 100% certainty that we'll catch everything. We caught so much that to, to recognize how few that we're seeing now compared to how many we saw this time last year for XP, we're doing pretty well from what I'm seeing. Um, I, I should mention one other thing about it. It turns out that uh, ASLR actually ended up hurting in the ANI case uh, because the code did restart automatically, and so it didn't actually um, uh, slow things down in that particular case. It's always interesting when you see how the things that you do create new environments that you hadn't expected. Um, got any sort of suggestions, any sort of things that uh, you find? Um, please do email the secure folks, securemicrosoft.com. That's the uh, uh, MSRC, Security Response Center. Um, and I don't know, how am I? I took less than an hour. I took less than an hour. I managed to get it all done in the time allotted. Um, Yay! Thank you. So, um, I don't know. You guys tell me how you want to do the scheduling because the, the, the goons are responsible for this. So, what do you want to do? Do you want, do you want me to stop or...? Yeah, one, t one talk left. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to... Answer questions while we're doing this, the, the trade-off of stuff, if you want. Okay, let's do that then.